You're listening to That Gratitude Guy podcast with David George Brooke. That Gratitude Guy. Learn about how gratitude turns what you have into enough through stories of motivation and inspiration. Wherever you are in your life and whatever you're going through, That Gratitude Guy is here to help you achieve great things and live a happier, healthier life. Change the way you live today right here with David George Brooke, That Gratitude Guy, starting now. Well, hi, everyone. Welcome to That Gratitude Guy podcast. I am David George Brooke, your host, where my mission is to have guests that relate and recall moments of their lives that were propelled and energized by utilizing the power of a gratitude mindset. You can expect a deeper dive into gratitude's immense power, a gratitude tip of the show, or maybe a gratitude nugget, how you can become a gratitude believer, and maybe one to three takeaways from the show and today's guest. My podcast is available every Tuesday morning at 5 a.m. on the Transformation Talk radio network and is available on Apple, Spotify, Google, and anywhere else you might get your podcast. Please subscribe and give me a five-star rating if you like what you hear. I do appreciate that. And also, a lot of people ask me about my gratitude journals, and to get a gratitude journal and to find out more about my gratitude coaching, speaking, or one-on-one coaching, go to thatgratitudeguy.com, or as you can see in the background, you can also reach me at thatgratitudeguypodcast.com as well. So let me get on to the favorite part of my show, and that is having my guests every week. And this week, a favorite guest is no exception, Chris Carlson. Let me tell you a little bit about Chris. Chris brings 30 years of sales, sales management, and sales coaching experience to the sales coach. He began his sales career in 1984 as a marketing representative of one of the leading insurance companies in the country. In his 19 years in the insurance industry, Chris held several corporate positions to include district manager, branch manager, and national sales manager. After 11 years in the corporate world, Chris formed his own independent marketing organization. 2013, Chris formed the sales coach to combine his unique experience and insight with the advances in technology to create sales development and coaching programs that engage and motivate individuals and teams to take action and achieve results. Chris, welcome to the podcast. David, thanks for having me. You bet. Thank you for being on the show. So I start out every show with the same thing, whether the listeners like it or not. How did you and I meet? You know, David, it was at a networking event. I remember exactly where we were, uh, Lake Union in Seattle. Uh, Our good friend, uh, Gary Pelaine, had an event, and we were at the end of the table. I can remember it vividly toward the water, and it was two two bald guys looking at each other going, huh, I wonder what that guy's all about. And uh, we just, it was instant that we hit it off. It was great questions that we asked each other. And from there, I think it's been, what, five or six years now, David, so. that we so. have regularly gotten together just to share ideas and, uh, you know, just stay up on what's going on in each other's business. So, again, I remember the, the, uh, the event vividly, and it was, uh, I was very lucky to, to have you come into my life, and I've really enjoyed our relationship since. Well, thank you. Likewise. And I, I mentioned maybe on every or every other podcast about my guests and how I've met them sometimes. And. I'm just fascinated. I've, I brought it up before, but I'll bring it up again about how when you meet somebody and you either click instantly or you just sort of think, well, this is a nice person, but I don't, I don't see anything going any further. And you and I kind of clicked right from the beginning. And the term that I always use for that, which I really like, is like-minded. And we see a lot of people, you and I are both, both very positive. I'm the gratitude guy and you're the sales coach. And it has a lot to do with how we you know, move about in the world personally or professionally. And so when you are like-minded, there's just that synergy that's there that you just don't get with, with certain people you meet along the way. So, so speaking of synergies, so back up and for the benefit of the listeners, you and I have been on the planet a little while, kind of walk back, uh, back towards the start of your career and talk a little bit about the journey that you, want, that you went on to get where you are today. Yeah, David. So, uh, you know, I was in college and I always remember I was trying to figure out what I was going to do after college and I really didn't know. And I got a postcard in the mail when I was in college and it was from the local recruiter for ROTC on campus. I answered the postcard, which proves direct mail works. And we had a discussion uh, with him. And so I, I joined ROTC my last two years of school uh, when I behind graduation was in the army uh, for four years. And then, which was a great experience. I always tell people I wouldn't give a million dollars for it, but I wouldn't give a plug nickel to go back in. Uh, Mm -hmm. It's just, I mean, you know, God love our troops. And especially in what we've seen over the last couple of weeks, we really appreciate what they're doing. 
but it is a different type of organization. It's very hierarchical. It's very, very much based on um, time and grade as opposed to talent. Mm. And, you know, but, but that is what it is. But it was a great experience, got great leadership skills. And then from there, I, I, I uh, went into the insurance business. I actually worked with an agency that placed military officers in the civilian world and went to work uh, for Provident Life and Accident, you know, here in Seattle, uh, right out of right out of the army and spent 11 years, uh, you know, with that company. Then, as you said in my in the introduction, formed my own independent marketing organization and did that for eight years and then actually went to work with somebody that I had met in the insurance business in the sales coaching and sales training area and worked with them for 10 years. And then, you know, eight years ago, started my own organization. So it's really, you know, been, it's been a great journey. Um, you know, I've really enjoyed every aspect of everything that I've done. You learn along the way, you meet great people. Uh, there's an old expression uh, out there that you'll be the same person five years from now than you are today, with the exception of the people that you meet in the books that you read. Mm. And those people that I met along the way have just been, uh, just been, you know, incredible. So that's a short version of, uh, of, of an old guy's biography. No, I appreciate that. And I'm writing that down books that you read too. And I'm going to come back to that in a minute. Uh, just to go back at a couple of things that you said, you mentioned four years in the army. So what was the, you know, and you mentioned the plug nickel too. That's funny. What was the best thing about it for Chris for those four years? Boy, I think the best thing about it was as a young person, so I graduated college at 22, is, you know, you immediately, uh, when you went to your first duty station, in my particular case, you know, I was in charge, at the, my first job in charge of 15 people, and then my second job in charge of 80 people. So mm -hmm. you quickly uh, have to develop leadership skills. And I think that's the one of the things that you know, the army does teach you, uh, you know, are those leadership skills. So certainly, you know, having that opportunity, you know, to lead uh, people was was the greatest experience that I had. And, you know, just as an FYI, so everybody don't think I'm that old. I mean, so I was in in the service, and there was nothing exciting going on in terms of global, global conflict. I was between the Vietnam War and, and the Iraqi War. And the only thing of, of, of concern at that time of the country is when the Korean airliner was shot down. And oh, there yeah. was some concern about what might happen. But other than that, I mean, it was a very peaceful time for the lack of a better word. So, uh, you know, again, wasn't, did not, did not serve in combat. And I have all the respect in the world for the men and women who have, you know, served in combat, you know, some of them gave their lives, some of them gave their limbs, you know, for the great things uh, for our country. Yeah. In fact, I go back to when uh, I used to tell people how old I am. I still do occasionally, but then occasionally I'll say, well, I saw the Beatles in concert twice. And so that <laughs> you can figure out how old I was from there. But, but, you know, regarding the service, I went through it at a time when Vietnam was um, happening. And, you know, I was looking back on it. And of course we have the, the advantage of looking back over five, six, seven decades, whatever. But I just think that two years in the service or for you, four years, and I did not end up going into the service. And I really wish I had. There's something about that that develops and women now too, but back then it was just men and just developing into a lot of the, you mentioned the leadership aspect, how to be part of a team. And, and it's just, gosh, I think sometimes in some ways I wish people still had to go into the service for the two years or whatever in this day and age, because you make a really, really good point. And also I think you mentioned too, time and grade versus talent. And I think it's interesting. My younger son works for Frito Lay down in San Diego when he just recently got moved to uh, promoted to Sacramento, but he told me something that this made me laugh because I've thought about that in organizations I've worked for. Is he got promoted and somebody said to him, "Why do you get promoted? I've been here longer than you have." And you know, it's always that when you said time and grade versus talent, and there's that whole thing. Well, who has the most seniority? Well, companies finally figured out that seniority isn't the only only aspect of how somebody how long they've been with the company, what kind of and especially leadership. And if I can put you on the spot for a second, because leadership is one of the hottest topics in, you know, speaking and, and books and so on and so forth. What, what's kind of Chris Carlson's version of what makes a good leader or contributes to good somebody having good leadership skills? Well, David, you know, I'm a firm believer that you're only as good as your people. And you've heard me say this on many occasions in our chats is that, you know, it's about the sheep, not about the shepherd. Mm -hmm. So it's really making sure that you take care of your people because they will take care of you. 
you know, as we, we have seen, and unfortunately we live in such a politically charged environment and where we have access to so much information, both on social media and, you know, the regular media. And there's just so many people uh, who are make it all about themselves and not about their team. And so I think to me, that is the real key for uh, a great leader is he or she taking care of the people that are taking care of them. Yeah, boy, that is that is so true. And I, I just don't understand. It's like, I forget who it was. Somebody was famous, was quoted as saying, uh, if you want to be success, success, successful, help other people get what they want. And I forget who it was. It was somebody that was pretty well known. But obviously, I talk a lot about gratitude. And, and you, since that day I met you at Lake Union, I've always been impressed with your attitude and positive and that sort of smile. It's almost kind of, with all due respect, it's kind of a smirk, which is actually great because it's always like he, he knows something. I don't know. I can't quite tell what it is, but where, how has gratitude played a role in your part is, is your part in your life in terms of the attitude and the glass half full and that type of thing, as you look back on your life? You know, David, you know, that's, a, that's a great question. And I, I believe that you nailed it right there is each and every day we have a choice, what our attitude is going to be. And so is it going to be half full or all the way full, or is it going to be half empty? And, and I'm a firm believer that, you know, anybody who was born in this country is we hit the lottery to just being born in the United States of America. Mm-hmm. And you think about, you see vividly what's going on in the world today in, in some countries that aren't nearly as fortunate as us. So when we wake up in the morning in this country, despite all the challenges that our country has at different times in its history, we still you know, have the ability to make a difference. We, we get to make a decision on what we're going to do today and whether we're going to have a positive attitude and we're, whether we're going to have a negative attitude. And David, I'm not Pollyannish. The reality is all of us go through, you know, things in our life. You've gone through some tragedies in your life um, and, and that I can't even imagine, right? Um, but nonetheless, you know, we still have to go forward because I, I look at it as, there's so many things that go on around us in the world that if we concentrated on the negative, we would just be vegetables if we focused exactly. on the negative. Exactly. So yeah, I think as human beings, we're predisposed to think positively. And then I think there are people out there who have to really fight some of that. Mm-hmm. But it's kind of a long winded way to say is I, I can't imagine uh, in, in the totality going through life without a positive attitude. I recognize that things happen to us some small, some tragic. Uh, you know, we, we, we seen recently on the TV about these, these 13 service members, you know, that lost their lives. And I can't imagine what their parents and loved ones are going through. It's hard to have a good attitude through that. Um, but, but in the totality, um, you know, we have to, I believe we have to be positive. We have to be grateful for mm-hmm. what's going on in the world today. Yeah. And it's interesting. You mentioned um, lottery, I've often thought I've called, I got this from somebody about Chris Carlson and David Brooke and, and any others that would feel this way. We won the birth lottery. All of a sudden, one day I came along on January 28, 1950. And it's like, I had a good set of parents and I was fed and clothed and nurtured and, and uh, had three brothers and a sister and raised in a very nice family. And, and up until the fact my parents got divorced when I was 16, I had a very idyllic upbringing. Well, how many people have that? And my younger son and I just took a a RV trip a couple months ago along the East Coast. And the biggest impact from the entire trip was seeing the Holocaust Museum and thinking about those people that they they did nothing wrong. They happened to be of Jewish faith or what have you. And they went through all that they went through. And so it just, it does remind you and how to be so fortunate. And so so do you, would you say you actually have a specific gratitude practice or is it more something that's just sort of in your brain every day? I would say it's more in my brain every day. Uh, it's, it's part of my DNA. Uh, but having said that, you know, I journal every day and mm. put thoughts uh, on, on paper. And it's kind of interesting now that we're sitting here talking about it. And it's what I put in my journal. I'm realistic, but I'm not negative, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. And I really mm-hmm. focus on, you know, the future and the positivity that's going on in my life. Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting. I was going to say, I don't know if I agree or disagree as much as I think it's an interesting perspective. People are predisposed to positive because I just, in the case of my father, who is one of the most negative people I know and other people I've met that just have such a kind of a negative attitude, which I don't understand. I I sort of wonder if we are predisposed to be positive or negative because 
I've contended, maybe I'll try this theory someday, that if Chris Carlson and Dave Rook are walking down a mall somewhere and we stop 10 random people and we say, I'm Chris, I'm Dave, we're going to start Chris and Dave's chocolate chip cookie store because we don't think there's enough good chocolate chip cookies. My contention is that nine out of 10 people would tell us what's wrong with that idea. Are you kidding me? There's more chocolate chip cookies. And so that's, of course, negative versus, oh, that sounds really exciting. How are you guys going to do it? How are you going to build your business? But so I think it's interesting how, and then somebody else said to me that we're predisposed to be negative because in a lot of ways, uh, life is really doesn't have a happy ending. You know, I mean, it kind of, it ends and it's kind of, everybody's moves on, you know, and we're all born and we all die and things. So, but it's interesting, but, but do you think that's something that you see as more people as positive or in your world, or do you find you've gotten away from a negative people? How has that impacted you? That's a great point is, is I try to stay away from the negative people as, as much as I can. Uh, that's my choice, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I, I definitely try to do it and, and kind of double clicking on the point that you just made. I think a lot of people, you know, want to be, you know, in, in, uh, want us to be negative or be unhappy because it makes them feel better. If that mm -hmm. makes sense. Yes. Uh, you know, they're kind of climbing on our backs. So, yeah, I, I just think it's uh, you bring up a great point about, you know, the the ending in which which you probably will have people on your podcast, you know, discuss about, you know, their religious views on, you know, how they look at the end. Um, you know, you know, certainly, you know, my belief is, is, you know, there, this is not a dress rehearsal. This is my one shot mm -hmm. on this planet. So I'm trying to do everything I can to, to maximize that. And again, I just don't understand anybody who can, again, I realize there's periods of time in people's lives where we suffer tragedies or unfortunate deals. Where we have to deal with it. But in the totality, as I said earlier, boy, you might as well be happy because, you know, this is it. Yeah, exactly. And a couple of things you said earlier really stuck with me too. Uh, the people that you meet and the books that you read, uh, you don't have to say the names of the people, but describe maybe one or two people and what they taught you or mentored you or whatever that were really key for you that really helped your journey along the way. Yeah, you know, David, I always remember uh, somebody who I went to, to work for in the insurance business. And he, he uh, subsequently became a very good friend and I mean, talk about leadership. He was he would do anything he could to help me without trying to climb up on my back, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I think so often people in leadership position are all about them yeah. and they will just run over you to get to the next level, what they perceive as the next level. And he was a person that just basically said, you know, how can I help you, mm -hmm. uh, you know, type of, a, of an individual. And, you know, David, I remember back to when we first met, what was really interesting. I think we tried to do outdo each other with asking each other questions. Oh, yeah. And so, you know, one of the things that I find out very quickly when I meet somebody is, are they talking about themselves, themselves, or are they asking questions just to find out more about me? Mm -hmm. And I think it tells a lot about the type mm -hmm. of people that I like to hang around. If it's always, they're always talking about me, 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 me. Right. Well, they're very, they tend to be very self-centered and are not really, as I said earlier, worried about the sheep, they're worried about the shepherd. Right. And so I really am gravitated toward people who, who have a genuine interest. And the only way I can tell if they have a genuine interest in me is that they ask questions. Exactly. And David, you and I've talked about this a lot. We run into tons of people and it is amazing how they will ask maybe one question at yep, the most, that. but there's never the follow-up. Exactly. And it's so important. And I don't know if I mentioned in our many conversations, but, uh, but even then you have to have, a, I guess, a balance to some degree, because I had, a, I got set up with a date with a gal one day and it was an uh, hour and a half. And then I walked her to her car and we, and she's about, I'm opening the door. I'm a gentleman. I and mean, she's about to get in the car. And I said, well, I think we should go out to dinner sometime, maybe in the next week or two. She goes, I don't think so. And I went, really? And she goes, I thought we had a good time back there. She goes, really? She points back to the restaurant. And she goes, I don't know if that was more of a date or more of an interrogation. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I guess I asked one too many questions, but I felt like I wanted to defend myself to your point about wouldn't you rather I'm asking you questions and wanting to find out about your life than me, 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 you know, enough about you more about me again, and that kind of thing. So that that's a very, very good point. And the people you meet, and you're known by the company you keep. And of course, if you want to help yourself help other people, which is something that I think you and I ascribe to as well. But how about the books that you read? Any tips for the listeners with that? Because you mentioned that's another really good tip as well. Yeah, you know, I, I, I split my reading uh, between, you know, fiction and nonfiction. Uh, mm -hmm. The fiction, um, I'm a uh, John Grisham oh, fan. Yeah. 
uh, just 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 consume everything you know that that he has uh, out there. Just absolutely love uh, what he does. Mm-hmm. You know, nonfiction. You know, a, a lot of I'm a. You've heard me say this before. I'm a big uh, reader of Dan Sullivan, the Strategic Coach. Mm-hmm. He has both little books and he has big books that just you know are, are very very interesting. You know, but but what I what I just try to do is to to see if there's something that might be of interest, and people will recommend a book, and I'll I'll check it out on Amazon. Amazon Prime, the greatest invention for dudes ever. Um, and then if it looks interesting, I'll read it. I you know I'm, my my goal is to read a book a week. Uh, you know, and, and not every book is you know War and Peace. So sometimes they're you know seventy pages. Sometimes they're three hundred pages. But it really is amazing. And I go back to the comment about the books that you read, the people that you meet and the books that you read. I mean, they they have a huge impact, you know, on your life. Sometimes it's just to relax. You know, if I'm reading those those Grisham books and my other favorite authors, James Patterson, mm-hmm. um, you know, just just to kind of uh, basically release, you know, that all that sometimes that stress that you can have in, in business. So so, again, kind of both sides of the fiction, nonfiction world. Yeah. And that makes sense. Cause then it just, it just kind of depends on it too. You know, speaking of recommending a book, I was thinking I have a good friend that paid me a really nice compliment one time. And I was just complimenting you about being on time and you and I are always very punctual. And it's just interesting how people run their lives and, and some are very fastidious about things and others are, you know, not as don't care as much, but this buddy of mine paid me a big compliment once he says, you know, I'll tell 20 people to buy a book. And he goes, you're the only one that'll actually buy it. And I always think, gosh, it's it. And that was a compliment. But at the same time, I thought if somebody goes out on a limb and says, Dave, Chris, here's a book you should read. I think it helps so-and-so. The least you could do is honor them by getting the book and reading it. And if it doesn't work out or something, I guess you can say, well, I didn't really appreciate it as much or like it as much as I thought. But just having somebody go out on that on that limb, I think is really important. And so that that kind of segues nicely into... I'm writing down some tips that you've had, but I look back at your career and the success you've had and the different things you're doing as I read the bio and so forth. So as a sales coach, that's of course in the sales world, but also a coach is a coach. So you've got some young person that's coming up and they're in their early twenties, they've done with college and you've got the benefit of all these years since those days in the army and school and, and developing your own business and so forth. What would be two, three, four, five tips that you might give to that person that said, Chris, I want to be successful. I see you as very successful. What are some of the things that I should do that will make me be able to follow the same path? Uh, great question. I think, you know, number one is, is having goals. Mm-hmm. Uh, Cause if, you know, if you don't have any goals, you know, how do you know if you accomplish them? Yeah. And look, our, our goals change along our journey. You know, sometimes it's, it could be as simple as to buy a car, or buy, a, buy our first house. And then it could be, you know, to run a company, to have X number of dollars in the bank, whatever. There's no right or wrong. It's whatever your goals are. So I think that, you know, certainly, you know, having goals is is the, the critical thing. I think number two is uh, journaling. Uh, I, I, it just keeps you focused, keeps you mindful of what those goals are. And, you know, obviously with the gratitude journal, I mean, it's just a, it's just a great tool you know, to, to remind us, you know, where, where we are, where we're going. So I think it, you know, journaling and be it gratitude or be it general, I think that that's very, very key. I, I, you know, when it comes to sales, David, I I think the thing I always like to tell people is that, you know, I think selling is easy, but prospecting is a bitch. Mm. So what you have to do is figure out how you're going to develop business. And, you know, back when you and I got started in selling is when I was out there, I mean, I didn't have a whole lot of things to do. I mean, I could, pick up the phone. I could knock on somebody's door, right? Those were the two main things, right? Right. And then, you know, maybe some organizations did some kind of direct mail or advertising, but those were bigger budget items back in the day. You Mm -hmm. think about today, a young salesperson, what he or she, all the tools that they have, and there's not one that's right or one that's wrong. It depends upon where your audience is hanging out. So be it, be it doing a podcast, doing, you know, spending time on Facebook, LinkedIn, you know, and I always like to tell people that when, you know, back in the day, there was no such thing, you know, as voicemail or caller ID. Right. So people had to pick up the phone. They had no idea who it was. So it's changed a lot. So salespeople have to adapt to that and, mm-hmm. and figure out where their, where their prospects are and then, you know, how they can best uh, get a hold of them. And I, you will hear me say a lot of my people that I coach is I think a podcast is one of the greatest opportunities 
uh, to develop business because you get to develop and deepen relationships with your guests. So why not invite your current clients, your centers of influence, and your prospects on your podcast? Not that it should be a podcast about your product or service, but about them. Like with you, David, it's, it's about gratitude, right? So if I were, let's just say I was a banker and I wanted to develop business, I wouldn't do a banking podcast. I'd do a you know, business weekly podcast to mm -hmm. talk to business owners that I would like to do. So I, I think there's so many tools that, that these young salespeople and the young people uh, can take advantage of uh, to be successful. And then, you know, what, what was the book, David? You know, uh, I learned everything in kindergarten. I forget the oh, exact name of the book. Yeah, uh, Robert Fulgham, I think it was. I, everything I needed to know, I learned in kindergarten, I think it and was. And then, you know, so the, the thing, David, that I, I grew up in the South and I, I, was, I was taught uh, a certain way in say please and thank you. Mm -hmm. And I think that as, as corny as sometimes that might sound, I think there's a lot of truth to saying please and thank you. And then somebody, you know, once said, and I'm, I'm going to use the words he said, so I'm not trying to be chauvinistic when I said this, when I say this, he said, you can tell the character of the man by the way he treats people who can do absolutely nothing yeah. for him. I've heard that's a phenomenal statement. And yeah. I, David, you and I go through life and we see people, you know, who maybe think they've achieved some success and they run across somebody who maybe they feel has been less than successful and the way that they address them, the way they talk to them is almost talking down. And you know what, that individual is probably working their butts off to be successful. So why do I have the right to talk down to somebody, you know, if I think yeah. I'm better off socioeconomically. So you know, I, I think it's I think it's those types of things and, you know, treat people, you know, properly and with respect. And I'm a firm believer what goes around comes around. And so I think you're stacking the odds in your favor, you know, to make sure that that karma, good karma is going to come back to you. Me too. I think you said that and I'm glad you, you came up with that quote because I'd heard that before and it's such a great quote. And uh, it, it's just one of I, I taught both my sons, uh, Kyle's 37, Connor's 27. And even something to me is when the waiter wait person comes over, even to refill your glass, you look them in the eye and you say, thank you. You know, and good manners just it never goes out of style. And hey, I, David, let me can I come back to something I said about growing up in the South? Yeah, I was really interesting when I was growing up in the South is that when I was introduced to the parents of a friend, mm -hmm. I would never ever, ever imagine calling them by their first name. Right, right. It was always Mr. or Mrs. And I, I look at today's generation right. and even very young kids, you know, under 10, maybe 10, 12, 11, right. when you get their friends introduce you, they call you by your first name. And I'm like, how does that happen? <laughs> and what, where, where have we, where have we gone wrong? Now that's a personal belief. And e even today, if I, if, if I, if your parents were alive, David, and you were to introduce me to them, I would address them as Mr. and Mrs. I couldn't right. imagine it, even though, right. you know, I'm, I'm certainly old enough to call them by their first name, right. just out of respect to both you and them. So sorry, it's a pet peeve, no, but, but, I, that's, but I think it goes, it goes back to just respecting people. And I think no. we've gotten away from respect and so, certainly social media has really played a big part in that. And it's, no. it's really, it's unfortunate that you know, people can say things and then hide behind it. So I don't want to go on a rant, but you know, it's just one of those things, again, just being respectful of people. I think you're going to go further faster. Yeah, no, I really agree. And whether you mentioned it's from the South or, or wherever, I don't, I just don't think good manners uh, go out of style. It's the same thing with good grammar. And, and I saw something, it was on TV last night. It was somebody who was pretty, I forget who it was, but pretty well known. And they asked her the question. She said, well, her and I went so-and-so. And I just went, I just couldn't comment. I just went, you know, so even grammar, manners, it's all, I don't think it ever goes out of style and so forth. So um, I'm going to wrap up in about four or five minutes. But I, so I got a couple of final questions I want for you to answer and, and to talk to the audience and listeners about. Throughout the times, you talked about some of the ups and downs that I went through, and I know you've had your share of challenges. Most of us that have been on the planet five or six or seven decades have. What have you found, if it was one thing at the top of the list, has been your best coping mechanism to deal with some of the ups and downs, in this case, the downs of that roller coaster ride? Now, David, this is my DNA, and I certainly don't say that this is the right way, uh, but for me, it has always been getting back to work. Mm. Um, and Because and, what it does, it allows me to focus on the future and not the past. Because I think it's very, very easy to dwell on the past and typically something happens 
and we're dealing with it. Okay, it's happened. So now the next minute it's in the past. And again, I am not suggesting that that's the right way to do it. I don't pretend to be smart enough to be a psychiatrist or a psychologist, but I just know that for me, it is, you know, recognizing the event or the situation, but not dwelling on it, but then, you know, going forward. And it's really interesting, David, have you ever had the chance to do the strength finders exercise? Yes. yes. Yeah. And so one of, you know, one of my, what they say is one of my strengths is futuristic. So mm. I tend to be thinking futuristic. And so when something bad happens, yep, I deal with it. Uh, I, 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 I pro- hopefully properly, right. And then start thinking about the future. And for me, it tends to be, you know, in the work and, and I want to make it, you know, kind of black or white. Certainly you think about your family, you think about your friends, you know, going forward, but that's been my default mechanism, right or wrong. Yeah. I like that though. And it doesn't, it doesn't mean to say it's right for everybody, but if it works for you and that in, in like anything like multiple choice, here's 10 different coping mechanisms, pick one, but just at least pick one, use one that's going to work for you and so forth. It's like, Somebody once told me about being organized. They said, I don't care what your system is, just get one. <laughs> and so whatever works, and if it's writing on your hand or something, that's fine. So, uh, but that's a great point because I think about going back to work myself after my wife died and just different things is there's a morning period and there's a time we go through and stuff, but that's a great point. And to have that ability to get back to work and get your focus somewhere else, because otherwise you can wallow in, in self-pity and, and anguish and everything for days on end and so forth too. So well, David, let me ask you this. I mean, you, you've been around some, some tough situations. Does it uh, surprise you sometimes how people just can't get out of that wallowing, if you will? I mean, even to the point, sometimes it's months or even years yeah. and, and they're still in it. Yeah. Now, again, not to diminish any tragedy that somebody goes through, but at some point in time, you know, you, you, you have to view the present as opposed to living in the, fa- the past, in my estimation. Right. No, it's, it's a great point because, and again, not to diminish the, the way they react or the person or whatever, it's just, I just think it's unfortunate. I remember after Dana died, I went to a support group. That was September 29th, 1998. So two weeks later, I went to a support group and you'd go around the room and talk and there'd be probably 17, 18 women, maybe a couple of men, because men typically died first. And, and so widows or widowers. And um, I remember, so when I finally felt like talking, I'd say my wife died and it was like two or three weeks ago. And I went for about a year. year but I'll never forget. I was sitting there one day and somebody I didn't really recognize. And she goes, and you know, my name is so-and-so and my husband, Joe died. And it was like 10 years ago and you're still coming to a support. I mean, again, not to diminish it, but I thought, man, isn't there at some point you're going to want to move on. It's kind of like the, the cut on your hand. It really hurts at first. And then you put a bandaid on and the next day it's kind of sore. And then pretty soon it just aches a little bit. And then a week or so later you pull off the bandaid and then now you don't really feel it anymore. I mean, it goes through the steps. I just feel bad for people that can't go through the steps because all of us are going to have traumatic events, at least for the most part, and how you come out of those to get back to whatever semblance of life you have, uh, the quicker, the better, I guess, or at least to get back to something, because it's a shame to let past events determine your future. In fact, what is your famous line you always tell me about the future better be better than the past? Yeah, the future's got to be greater than your past. And I, I think that applies to uh, any, any, anybody, but especially, David, people get to be our age. You know, mm-hmm. so many of people we know are, are retiring, whatever yes. that means. Um, and, and their future is not greater than their past. Their glory in their mind was in the past. Yeah. Well, so I think what that does, it makes it very, very challenging, you know, to be grateful every morning that they get up because you can only play so much golf. Exactly. Right? Uh, you know, some people like to travel. Well, that's certainly taken a hit over the last you know year and a half. Right. So again, I my my point when I say that to people is not that you got to be your future's got to be greater than your past in your current profession, but there has to be something that you are excited about getting up every day for, and you're making a contribution. Because again, as I said, and I really believe, I mean, it's our it's our one shot here. You know, so give it all you got. Yeah, I, I, of course, agree 100%. And I think in the word that to me kind of summarizes that is purpose. I think once you lose your purpose, I think it's really problematic. And I think even in my talks, I'll talk about some of these people that lost their purpose. Bear Bryant, uh, Alabama four championships, he retires and he's dead six months later. And Joe Paterno gets fired and goes through all that seven months later, he was dead. There are just all sorts of examples of those where Andy Rooney does his last broadcast on 60 Minutes, about six months later, he dies. So it's that purpose. I think that's really instructive in terms of, of keeping that purpose. And, and speaking of instructive, we're going to wrap up and have one last question for you, but I want to just hit some of the 
the um, uh, highlights that I have and takeaways, I think were really good. You mentioned the people that you meet, I think is so important. Uh, and that you have in your life, the books that you read, I think that was really important as well. Uh, leadership, uh, you're only as good as, the, as your people, which is so true. And I got to lead a lot of people at Nordstrom and Lowe's and things, and it's so important. Uh, and speaking of people, it's not about the sheep. Uh, it's, not, it's about the sheep. It's not the shepherd. Well, the people are the sheep, and that's what's really important. And back to that, if you want to help somebody succeed, help them get what they need to get, and then you will be just fine. Um, we have a choice every day. We're predisposed to be positive. Um, and then some of the tips to having goals, I think is really important journaling. And I noticed in my gratitude journal that I sell, there's a place for kind of the diary notes and two, so you can do everything in the same place, but it's, it's main function is gratitude, but you can make those other comments, uh, going where your prospects are for people that have tips, a podcast. I started out this, the first and second and fourth Fridays, I think it was now I do it once a week. I enjoy it so much. And I totally agree with you on the value of a podcast. And then the last point you made there was great manners, respecting people and just maybe getting back to respect or just maybe we should never lost it, but just having the respect is so, so very important. And then I like what you said about the best coping mechanism, getting back to work. And that doesn't mean that works for everybody, but we all need healthy coping mechanisms. And as I say about the gratitude journal, it can help you immeasurably. And it's a very healthy coping mechanism in an absolute world of destructive and deadly ones that take people's lives every day. Cause why do people do drugs and these other things? They're looking for relief. You know, there, there's no big, no big mystery as to why this goes on. They don't like their current state. So they figure I'll take this pill or do this drug and that'll take me somewhere else and I won't be in pain or whatever. So any healthy coping mechanism is fantastic. So my last question for you, Chris, is always my last one for every guest. And that is, uh, and you only get to pick one thing, maybe two, but one, uh, what do you know today you would have liked to known at 18 that would have helped you? Wow, David, you, I tell you what, you always come up with some some great questions. Thank you. Wow, what would I like to know today? Um, I would say that focus, you know, on the journey and 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 not necessarily the end result. Mm. I think we we send you know, we we set those goals, and along the way, we forget to enjoy the journey. Uh, you know, we, 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 we forget to enjoy the people that are around us, the family that's around us, the experiences that we have. And pro like you, David, as a young man, we, we were very goal oriented, right? And we were looking, you know, at the horizon. And of course, what they what we know is the horizon never gets any closer, right? It's always going to be there. So, you know, how how is that journey, you know, to the horizon? So, you know, that would 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 certainly be, uh, you know, one of the ones. And, and I would say uh, what I'm learning about the what's happening with health and diet is, you know, I went a lot of years and I, to this day, I'm guilty of, of eating crap and, you know, knowing because because what's really interesting is in 1900, the average life expectancy in this country was 49. Well, now it's like 70, it was 78. It might drop down a year or so because of COVID. Right. But, you know, so people were thinking, I might as well go all out. What difference? Right. I'm not going to live that long. Well, you know, now, we're, you know, the fastest growing segment of our society is 80 and above. Wow. So I would think that probably I would have eaten a lot better over the years uh, than all the burgers and the pizza that I that I uh, consumed. As I was told at some point earlier in my life, you are what you eat. And yeah, I exactly. thought that was such a great line. But but such a good point to focus on the journey and not the end result. Uh, something that comes to mind to me, and then we'll wrap up, is that I end up watching on Netflix or Amazon Prime sometimes these stories about the uh, Mount Everest and the people, how many people have died and the people that so many people go up in those expeditions. But I, I don't know if I just didn't really realize it with all the preparation to go through the different stages when they get up there. When they get to the summit, I think they're there like a half hour. I mean, it's not much. It might be an hour. It might be, and then they go back down. So talk about the journey versus the end result. You want to get to the summit. That's the goal, but you're absolutely correct. And I, I know in many conversations with you and I, we're so fortunate because I feel really it's a get to versus a have to with what I get to do and you get to do. And, and I just wish more people could get to there considering so many people, 60, 70, 80% of the surveys say hate their jobs and why not just enjoy it? So, but so is, is, isn't, isn't that crazy that that many people crazy. are that unhappy. So you wonder about the depression and the, 
the drug abuse and alcohol abuse, if they're unhappy, just spent where they spend the majority of their day. Right. Oh my goodness. That's, that's, that's horrific. I always feel for those people. I do too. I do too. Well, I hope that at least maybe one or two people have been encouraged today to find a job or something you can do to make a living that you enjoy. If you find something you're passionate about, it sure makes a difference. So, so that's it for this episode. I covered a bunch of the takeaways. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Chris. Those were excellent. And uh, just to, as a reminder, as I mentioned earlier, my podcast is available every Tuesday morning at 5 a.m. It is downloaded to the Transformation Talk Radio Network and is available on Apple, Spotify, Google, and other podcast networks. Please subscribe and give me a five-star rating if you like what you hear. Always appreciate that. Purchase a gratitude journal or to find out more about my speaking, coaching, or the journals or books, please contact me at thatgratitudeguy.com. And also, a lot of people ask me about my Monday morning minute. I send out a 60-minute gratitude video every Monday morning at 6.15 in the morning. And if you're interested in getting that, go to your text and text in the number 22828. That's five digits, 22828, and type in the message box, gratitude guy, all one word. And it'll get you signed up to get my Monday morning minute every Monday. And also as an exclusive for my podcast listeners, I'm offering my three month proprietary gratitude coaching program with one extra month free. If you heard about it on the gratitude guy podcast, and just please email me at David at that gratitude guy. So finally, thank you so much for tuning in. It's so great to have listeners and followers out there to that gratitude guy podcast. I really appreciate it. And remember, I am that gratitude guy. And remember what I always say at the end, just be grateful and never quit. So long. Thanks, David. You bet. Thanks, Chris. Thank you for listening to That Gratitude Guy podcast with David George Brooke, where living with gratitude turns what you have into enough. Transformation starts now and you have everything you need to achieve great things. In a world that is constantly changing, there is motivation and inspiration right in front of us. And you can find yours right now. Don't wait. Visit thatgratitudeguy.com to get started living with gratitude today.